I said that the passport to success students were late. And I've been informed that they weren't late. They were here getting their flu shots. So welcome. I saw you come in. <laughs> we're glad that you're here. you're here and we're glad that you found the flu shot. So just a reminder too, do take advantage of the free flu shot, the health check, and don't forget as well to sign up for the My HSA patient portal while you're here too. So our next speaker is Dr. Jamil Bashir. He's going, he specializes in regenerative medicine and interventional orthopedics, and he's with Regenix K-Man. He's here today to talk about the future is now, 21st century healing with your own stem cells. He's a graduate of the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland, and prior to attending medical school, he received a BS degree in biochemistry, magna cum laude, and a bachelor of science degree in biology, also magna cum laude, from the University of Maryland at College Park. He completed his internship in general surgery at the Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C., and residency training in physical medicine rehabilitation at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in Miami, Florida. During residency, Dr. Bashir worked closely with the Interdisciplinary Stem Cell Institute at UM, publishing a literature review on stem cell use and musculoskeletal diseases, as well as helping to develop a pilot study investigating expanded stem cell use in the treatment of facet joint arthropathy. Desiring to pursue further training in regenerative medicine and interventional orthopedics, he completed a fellowship in interventional orthopedics at the Centeno Schultz Clinic in Broomfield, Colorado. He continues to actively publish and research in the field of regenerative medicine and interventional orthopedics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jamil Bashir. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jamil Bashir. I'm very grateful to be here today. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to speak to you uh, about what we do uh, in Cayman and actually throughout the United States. There's some students in the room. Can you raise your hand if you're a student who's here? I think there were some, uh, some nursing students and are you guys high school students or college students? Out of, just out of high school. Well to the students I say success to you all. Just keep working hard and anything you want to come true will happen. So. Good luck and thank you for being here. Always good to have students in the audience. Um, thank you, Dr. Smith, for your talk. I'm actually from Maryland. Uh, that's where I was raised. That's where my whole my family is still. Um, so always great to hear about things going on uh, in the good state of Maryland. Um, so as, again, I practice regenerative medicine and or interventional orthopedics uh, with a practice actually in Colorado. And what happened was about uh, four or five years ago, there was a partnership uh, between ourselves and a group here, a medical group here, Harmonic Health, which developed, which allowed us to bring advanced stem cell therapies uh, to the Cayman Island. And it's been a, a great partnership. We've been able to help a lot of people and uh, come down here and experience uh, the very good culture and friendly people of the Cayman Islands. So this talk is going to be an overview of many things. So we'll talk about stem cell basics. I'm going to do my best to kind of explain what we do in a way that's understandable. Uh, healing with stem cells. We're going to talk about how your body heals itself, how we've learned how the body heals itself, and how we use that knowledge to apply it to injury and amplify and accelerate healing in the human body. We're going to talk about different conditions that we treat, biomechanics, and how different parts of the body play together. For instance, an injury in the knee very often is the resulting of an injury in the hip or the ankle. So everything is connected. You can't just look at one body part and separate in isolation from everything else. And that even goes further into the, the spiritual and mental and emotional part of, a, part of a human being. Bless you. Part of a human being. And, and we take all of that into account with what we do. Uh, the role of technology. So what we do, the use of stem cells uh, and regenerative medicine would not be able to be accomplished today without the co-evolution of technology. So technology is evolving and growing as the biotechnology is evolving and growing, and that is allowing us to apply these uh, very advanced procedures in, a, in the present uh, day and age. We'll talk about the advanced treatment options in the Cayman, uh, what we can do here, which is unique, and in my opinion, the most advanced orthopedic regenerative medicine treatment in the Western Hemisphere at least. 
We'll talk about a local case study. Uh, and we actually have a, a guest here who has uh, been gracious enough to come and actually speak about her own story. And then we'll talk about future trends, kind of where this is going. So this is the overview. So where do we begin? Stem cell basics. So I'm going to try to get rid of some misconceptions, probably create some new misconceptions. But nonetheless, we're going to talk about stem cell basics as we go through this. So to begin, your body is a composition of lots and lots of cells. You have a kidney cell. You have a liver cell. You have a brain cell. You have a blood cell. All these are different cells. All are unique and all are specialized for a specific function. So how does this happen? How does your body go from an embryo, one cell, to two, to four? To, how does this happen? And it's very interesting how it happens. So in the beginning of life, there's one cell. After fertilization, there's one cell. One cell becomes two cells. Two cells become four cells. Four cells become eight cells. Eight cells become 16 cells. 16 cells become 32 cells, and then the story starts to change a little bit. So when, six, when 32 cells are there, they start differentiating. That means they become different from one another. There's an endoderm, an ectoderm, and a mesoderm. Three cell lines begin to form. From those three cell lines, every other cell in your body evolves. It grows. Ectoderm gives rise to your skin, your nerves. Endoderm, more or less, creates your organs. And mesoderm, more or less, creates your skeleton, your muscles, your bones, your tendons, your ligaments, all the things that allow you to kind of function and move throughout the world. It's the mesoderm that we're discussing here. When the, when the adult is formed, those three cell lines have more or less differentiated, minus one stem cell type, and I, and I say, say this with kind of an illusion that science is growing, and what I say today, 10 years from now, someone's going to look back and say, oh, that guy, he didn't know what he's talking about. Because in 10 years, what I'm saying now will have changed. That's how fast this field is going. But for now, for the present day and age, more or less in your body as an adult, you have one remaining of those early three cell types, and it's called a mesenchymal stem cell from the mesoderm, from the cells that give rise to the connective tissue, to the skeleton. And that's what we work with. We work with adult mesenchymal stem cells. Now, why is that important? That's important because everyone has seen in the news a discussion of embryonic stem cells. And there obviously is an ethical debate, should we or should we not be able to use them? The good thing about what we do is we don't use them whatsoever. We use adult mesenchymal stem cells. These are not embryonic stem cells. These do not come from embryos. These come from you. These come from your body. They're taken from your body. They're put back into your body. These are called adult mesenchymal stem cells. These are not embryonic cells. Now, the differentiating factor between what we use and what embryonic stem cells are, and the reason certain researchers really would like to use them is because those embryonic cells are before those 32 cells have begun to change. They're in the 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. They're those types of cells. They haven't differentiated. They haven't become one of those three. They can become any cell type. They can be used for, to heal brain cancer. They can heal pancreatic cancer. They can heal diabetes. They can do anything. That's why people want to use them. Ethical discussion side, that's, that's the reason they want to. But then, of course, there's the ethical debate. We use adult stem cells. They are multipotent cells. They are able to become skeleton, tissue, muscle, tendon, bone, ligament. Orthopedic type conditions can be treated with them. The totipotent cells, the, the embryonic stem cells, those are different. So we're working with adult mesenchymal stem cells, multipotent cells. Now there's another word that comes up when you begin to talk about this. There's autologous and there's allogenic. All these terms, honestly, it took me like three years to understand what people were talking about, and I finally got it. So I'm going to explain it to you in three minutes. So if you don't get it, that's OK. So there's autologous stem cells, and this is what we work with. Autologous means they come from you, and they go back into you. Allogenic stem cells are different. Allogenic stem cells come from someone. They're cleaned in a way to remove these surface proteins, and then you can put them into anyone. Those, that's what drug companies are trying to use. They're trying to develop allogenic stem cells. They're trying to develop a way to take someone else's stem cell, put it in a bottle, and then more or less sell it. What we use is your own cell. We like to use your own cell. We feel like your body is going to work better with a cell that's coming from you. And the reason for that is that every cell has signature. Every cell has proteins. It has these little markers on the outside. 
And very early when you're developing, your immune system starts going through this process. It starts recognizing self and other, self, other, self, other. And it starts attacking all of the other and protecting all the self. These are self. Your immune system will not recognize these. It will not attack them. It will allow them to grow and rapidly differentiate into tissue as they begin the healing process. So this is what we use. We use autologous adult mesenchymal stem cells. So this is a little history, just a brief slide to kind of give an overview of what we're discussing and where we are today in 2015 in a very short period of time, beginning in 1970 when this gentleman here, Dr. Friedenstein, isolated these cells in bone marrow. He started doing experiments on bone marrow. He looked at the bone marrow, he said, oh my gosh, there is a cell there that can grow into other cells. And people said, you're crazy. You're crazy just like this guy was crazy, who in the 1860s had this theory. He was a pathologist, Dr. Julius Kohnheim, a German pathologist, had the same idea. In the 1860s, they told him he was absolutely crazy. He had no way to prove it. And by the time he passed, no one thought about it again until the 1970s when this gentleman, Dr. Friedenstein, discovered them, proved that this gentleman was not crazy, that he neither was crazy, and these cells do exist. And they're in your marrow, and they can differentiate and grow into different types of tissue. This is one of his colleagues, also a very important name in the field, Dr. Maureen Owen. And the two of them together really accelerated our understanding of stem cells. This is a gentleman, his name is Arnold Kaplan. If you read the literature, this is the name you will see over and over again. This man has spent his life deciphering the mysteries of these cells and has really advanced the field. Now, just to give a timeline again, so in 1970, Dr. Friedenstein proves he's not crazy, finds these cells, and in 2012, this man, Dr. Yamanaka, a Japanese researcher, takes that mesenchymal cell, that adult cell, puts it in a solution of molecules and turns it back into an embryonic cell and proves that we don't know what is going on. <laughs> and he got the Nobel Prize because no one could prove him wrong and everyone was shocked and they were scared, so they gave it to him. So that's the timeline. So in 45 years, we went from finding them to changing them back to embryonic cells and teaching ourselves that we have a lot to learn. So let's talk about your body's healing and what we do. So this is regenerative medicine. So we use the body's own capacity to heal itself. What does that mean? Everyone at some point, unless you're really, really, really lucky, has hurt something. You've sprained an ankle, you've stubbed your toe, you banged your elbow, you fell off a ladder. Something got hurt, it got swollen, your mom told you to put ice on it, you put some ice on it, and the swelling went down. So what is the swelling? The swelling is inflammation. The swelling is blood rushing to the area of injury. It's the blood vessel becoming permeable, opening up to the blood, bringing the nutrients from the circulation into the injury so the body can begin to heal itself. So what happened is people started saying, wow, this blood stuff, this stuff is really good. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it, we're gonna spin it down, and we're gonna separate the different parts, and we're gonna isolate them. And as they started looking at the parts of blood, they found out that platelets, which are like circulating band-aids, you get a cut, the platelets rush to the area, they stop the bleeding. And they found out that these platelets, they have all kinds of, all kinds of healing molecules in them, growth factors, molecules that are able to attach to different receptors on cells and stimulate healing, stimulate cartilage synthesis, tendon synthesis, ligament synthesis. This is how your body heals. It sends blood to injuries. It sends platelets to injuries. Platelets release, release growth factors. They release signaling molecules, and your body begins to heal. Platelet-rich plasma, a way of spinning down blood, isolating these platelets, and then injecting them back a million, two million, 10 million times the normal body's response, still the body's normal response, though. That's platelet-rich plasma. That's a part of what we do. So what are platelets? So in your bone marrow, there's all kinds of cells. Your bone is like the factory of cells, and we'll talk about that again in a minute. Part of those cells are called hematopoietic stem cells. They ultimately become your red blood cells. They also become something called megokaryocytes, which then fragment into platelets. Platelets are like broken down old, broken down meg megokaryocytes. They're packets of cytoplasm, which, which just means fluid in the cells, and, and packets of growth factors. They're basically ways of delivering signals for your body to heal itself. That's what platelets are. So how do stem cells and PRP heal? Well, we talked about inflammation. Inflammation is your body trying to heal itself. 
You get an injury, your body sends blood, it sends nutrients, and it sells, sends ultimately stem cells to sites of injury, and we'll talk about that too. So how does the body work? How do you heal when you have an injury? And again, we're talking about skeletal injury here. That's what we're, we're focusing on. We're working on the adult mesenchymal stem cells. These are the cells that are capable of healing skeletal injuries. So we're, let's talk and focus on skeletal is, issues, things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day you're doing something. You may not even realize it. You twist your back, it hurts for a little while. You go to sleep, it feels better the next day. On some level, all of this is happening. Every single day in all of us, this is happening on some level. You get a little injury, blood rushes to the site, just like we talked about. Bleeding and inflammation occurs around the injured tissue, first thing that happens. Then nerves, capillaries, veins, new tissue begins to grow. How does new tissue begin to grow? New tissue begins to grow because these growth factors, these signaling molecules, act on the tissue there they have ways of having tissue lay down new collagen, new nerve endings, new blood vessels. Everything starts growing into the area. And ultimately, mesenchymal stem cells, both present in the tissue and in your marrow that actually mobilize to the site of injury, get involved in this process. This is how your body heals itself, happening all day, every day, every time you stub your toe, bang your elbow, scratch yourself reading a book everything. So tissue heals itself. Ultimately, you get back to a normal state. Everyone has gone through this process. Sometimes you heard something, wow, it took, it took three months to heal that ankle that time. Probably had a worse injury. Your body just needed to mobilize more cells. It took more healing, more stem cells from the bone marrow had to be attracted there. Sometimes you heal something in a week. Sometimes you notice when you're eating more healthy or sleeping more healthy, you heal faster, your immune system is healthier. All of these things we use when we practice regenerative medicine. We work with the body's own healing response, so we try to optimize health throughout the process. So tissue repair, the different phases, just to review. So bleeding occurs, we talked about bleeding, then inflammation, the swelling, then proliferation. What is proliferation? This is once that inflammation, all that swelling is kind of calmed down, everything is hyperactive, everything is just beginning to heal, beginning to grow. And then remodeling, the last phase, and this can take months. This is, again, sometimes why you have an injury, it hurts, and it takes three, four months for you to finally just stop thinking about it. And everyone knows something is fully healed when you no longer think about it. If you're thinking about it, it's not all the way healed. Then all of a sudden, one day, you don't even remember not thinking about it because it just goes away, and that's just... That's just how we are as human beings. We just, when things aren't bothering us, we don't think about them anymore. And this is well past the remodeling phase. So just to review the different growth factors in platelets, there's many molecules. PDGF, the signals cell growth, new generation repair of blood vessels, collagen production. FGF, again, tissue repair. EGF, promotion of epithelial cell growth. This is when you cut your skin, these growth factors go off. They tell the skin cells to regrow. TGF beta, it's very important. Well, we use this a lot. This actually also induces deposition of collagen, cartilage. It allows injuries like arthritis, diseases like arthritis to begin to heal. And VEGF, this is another molecule that allows more blood vessels, more nutrition, more healing molecules to come to the site of injury. All of these are within platelets. That's why we isolate them. That's why we magnify them. So what, where do these growth factors go? What do they do? Well, they attach to receptors on cells, which ultimately bind to proteins, go into the nucleus of those cells, and turn on DNA. Everyone's heard of DNA. DNA is the building block, the instruction, the life code. Goes into the DNA and stimulates synthesis of new proteins, those proteins get secreted by the cells and new tissue begins to heal. And this is how your body is functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Collagen, these are the fibers that create your tendons, your muscle. Bone is a bit different, but these are the strands of life. And as healing takes place, new strands are spun down and that is how you heal. Again, that's what we're working with here. The other part of the story, like I said, when you have an injury, to some level, stem, stem cells from your marrow are actually getting attracted to the site of injury. There are also stem cells that were born in your marrow that are everywhere in your body. They're hanging on to blood vessels. Your body knows that you're going to hurt yourself. It knows you're human and it knows you're going to make mistakes. And it knows when you do, it's going to need to put these cells right where you hurt yourself. 
So these cells are in the blood vessels everywhere. They're just hanging onto the blood vessels, just waiting, waiting for that day that you trip, on a, a trip off of a step or something, and they're just waiting to go there. They come from the bone. They're born in the bone. The bone is like a production factory. And this is where we harvest them from. So in our clinic, when we're doing stem cell aspirations, we take them from the ileum. It's this bone right here on the back of your hip. But the reason we take that place is it's a reservoir. There's, there's stem cells in every bone in your body. They're in different concentrations in different bones. This bone has a lot of them. It's easy to get to, and we can numb it up very well. When I'm working with patients, I always tell them, if the pain level goes above a three, stop me. I'll put more anesthetic down. We'll get you through this. Believe it or not, the bone marrow process, it's more nerve-wracking than it is painful. You're on, your, you're on your stomach. Someone's behind you with a large needle. It can be... It can make you nervous, to say, to say the least. So generally speaking, we tend to just kind of walk people through some breathing exercises. And then we do the extraction using local anesthesia. We try to make it as numb as possible. So this is how the process goes. The needle goes into the bone marrow. We do about three to four sites on each side. And we take those cells off. We take them off. They're clinging to the bone. We just kind of vacuum them off. And they suck right into the syringe. They go down to the lab. The scientists there do their remarkable work. And next thing we know, we've isolated millions of these cells from your marrow. So this is the bone aspiration process. So what is bone? We talked about bone. Bone is a factory. Bone is a living tissue. When I first started working in this field, some of the procedures we do, we actually put drills in the bones. If there's lesions in the bone, we actually inject sometimes cells directly into the bone. And I, when I first started working with this field, I started realizing that just with my hand, sometimes I could actually screw these needles into the bone, these small drills. Bone is dynamic. It's not, it's hard for sure. Bone is a hard tissue, but it's, it's actually more soft than you'd realize. It's a living tissue. It's able to remodel. It's very, very vital, very alive, and it's creating new cells on a daily basis. Hematopoietic stem cells, the cells that become red blood cells. Adult mesenchymal stem cells, the cells we're talking about. The repair cells of the body, they're all produced. They all live in the marrow. Think of your marrow as a factory of cell production. This is a factory. A lot of things are made in this factory. A lot of things are made in your marrow. And just like this factory is making cars, sending cars out on the highway, your bone marrow is making cells, sending them out into the bloodstream to all the different parts of the body. So think of your bone as a factory, which is why we take the cells by a bone marrow aspiration from the bone. Again, bone marrow, the production site of MSCs. Very, very, very active tissue. A lot of activity going on in your bones. Be good to your bones. Calcium, vitamin D, little weight-bearing exercises. Try not to smoke cigarettes. All of those things that doctors are telling you, all of those things will help your bones be more healthy. So healing with stem cells. I'm going to go a little deeper in the discussion now. We talked about blood rushing to the area, bringing the growth factors there. We talked about some of these cells being in the tissue and kind of beginning the healing process, some coming from the bone marrow. So these are the stem cells. This is what we're talking about. This is a stem cell. As you can see, it has a lot of little processes, these little kind of antennas. Almost looks like an alien. It's got these little kind of receptors. It's kind of grabbing. And this cell is extremely intelligent. When it gets to a site of injury, it grabs, it latches on to that injury, and it recognizes what's injured. If it's, remember, these cells can become skeletal. These cells, if they come in contact with a nerve, they can't grow into that type of tissue. We're talking about ligament, tendon, bone, muscle, cartilage, connective tissue. When they come in contact with a connective tissue that has been injured, a signal is sent into the cell from these processes, and the DNA in the cell actually begins to change. It goes through something called morphogenesis, differentiation. And to some degree, these cells then begin to grow into new tissue. That was why in the 1860s, when this gentleman thought they existed, nobody believed him. It took till the 1970s for someone to find them and prove, oh my gosh, these cells exist. It revolutionized medicine. We're having this discussion today. The future, especially to all the students here, you're going to see that as your careers develop. You're going to see everyone will be talking more and more about regenerative medicine and stem cell Therapies, because as human beings you grow, as we gain more knowledge of how our bodies work, we're realizing that stem cells are there, and they're controlling a lot of the processes in your body. So this is a stem cell. 
So how do they work? When you have an injury, that injured tissue releases a molecule. And in a gradient-like fashion, because the most is at the site of injury, and then it starts diffusing throughout the body, these cells in the marrow kind of follow it like clues, trying to get to the place where the most of this molecule is. It's called SDF1. It's a signaling molecule, stromal-derived growth factor. It actually brings these cells from the marrow to the site of injury. This is how your body works. What we do is we take those cells from the bone marrow, we isolate them, we amplify them, and we inject them to the site of injury. We rely on the cell's intrinsic intelligence, its ability to know where it is. These cells are highly intelligent. They not only can grow into new tissue, they control the immune system. They turn other cells on and off. They're like the foreman in a construction site. The more we learn about them, the more we realize this, these cells are how your body is conducting a lot of its activities. Not only tissue repair, not to digress, but also fighting disease. These cells are involved in the immune response in general. Very active cells. And they're attracted to sites of injury by signaling. So everyone has seen this. This is just a, a picture of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's kind of human being or what he perceived it to be. And the reason I put this slide in here is we're advancing. This is the 1600s. He was like the first person to do gross dissection that we have anatomical pictures of. The Middle Ages in, 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 uh, in the Arab world, in the Spanish world, in throughout the world, there's been scientists and physicians that have made discoveries. The Greeks, going back to Hippocrates. This is a culmination of every culture in Mali, in every culture you can think of has, has had physicians that have developed medicine, and here we are, and it's continuing to grow. So the field of regenerative medicine is a continuation of a long line of physicians and discoverers who have added to this. So the, the story continues. So what I say today, 10 years from now, someone will listen to this talk and say, wow, he knew a little something, but he had a lot of things wrong. Because the fact of the matter is things will change. They do. Things will change, and they do. So moving on to who we are. So Regenex is a group of practicing physicians in the United States that began out of Colorado. Doctors Christopher Centeno and Dr. John Schultz were the pioneers in this field. And what happened is about 10 years ago, they developed an acute fascination with what was happening in the field at that time of veterinary medicine, beginning with the racehorses more or less. Racehorse owners were trying to get their horses healthier to run in matches, and they started doing all these experiments with bone marrow and blood. We couldn't do them on humans at the time, it was illegal. So Dr. Centeno and Dr. Schultz said, well, there's, there's these vets, they, they know a little something. Let me go check out some of their discussions. And they would go, and these guys would spend hours on their free time just listening to these discussions, and they started applying what they learned to the human condition. And over the next 10 years, they developed a very successful clinic in Colorado. Now, when this happened, other practitioners in the United States were practicing this field of medicine. And they started saying, well, those guys out in Colorado, they're very organized. They're not only applying the science, but they're analyzing it at the same time. They're really trying to figure out what's going on. They're researching it. They're collecting data. They're saying what works, what doesn't. And these other clinics in the country that were competing with them started saying one by one, you know what? Those guys seem very organized. They seem like they're not just trying to sell something. They're actually trying to advance a new field. I'm going to join them. Well, over the last five, six years, 28 clinics have popped up in the country that are part of the Regenix network. Now it's an interconnected network of 28 clinics that performs these procedures, collects data, and we look at it, we look at the data from all the clinics and we see what's working, what's not. We continue to advance the field, and we're trying to legitimize regenerative medicine to let people know there are other ways of healing things, cheaper ways, better ways, and simpler ways, less painful ways, and more effective ways, because the fact of the matter is things are changing. There have been 22,340 regenic procedures performed up until this day. So a lot of procedures have been performed. And we're talking today, so obviously a lot of people are benefiting from this. If you look at the research in the field, 33% of published literature comes out of the clinic in Colorado, a third of the published literature. So we're very active in research, in writing, and we're really trying to spread knowledge to everyone. Because it's great when new things develop and people can get healing. I myself, the reason I got in this field is when I was in college, I suffered something called Parsonage-Turner syndrome. No kidding, I woke up one day and my right arm wouldn't lift any higher than this, and I don't have any doctors in my immediate family, so we didn't know what to do. Went to the emergency room, they told me I pulled a muscle. Six months later, I realized I didn't pull a muscle because my arm still didn't work. 
Finally got to a neurologist who diagnosed me with a rare neurological condition. Two years it took me to get my arm better. Two years I watched doctors not know what they were doing with my condition. And I knew I wanted to go to medicine. I said, when I get there, eventually I'm going to figure out a way to help people with problems like I had. So that's why I like doing what we do. And we're actually beginning to develop new strategies. When I had my diagnosis, I remember my physician told me, he said, you'll be better. Nerves will grow about a millimeter a day. You can expect your arm to work again in about three, four years. I just looked at him. I was like, bye. And I just walked out. And I found an acupuncturist who got me about 80% better in about six months. And it tuned my mind in before I got to medical school that doctors don't know everything. There's a lot of different ways to heal things. And we really need to be open-minded. So orthopedic injuries and conditions. So this is what we do. We work with orthopedic injuries and conditions. Uh, we work with skeletal muscle injuries, cartilage injuries, tendon injuries, muscle injuries, bone injuries, anything that those adult mesenchymal stem cells can grow into, well, that's what we work with. We're focused on that. So what does that mean? We treat orthopedic injuries and degenerative conditions, including joint arthritis, tendon and ligament tears, cartilage damage, non-healing fractures, and more, nerve problems. So everyone has tried a sport at some point, some better than others, but nonetheless, everyone has tried to get active and probably hurt themselves at some point. Rotator cuff tears, shoulder injuries. These respond extremely well to what we do. Partial rotator cuff tears, in my experience, the patients I treat, probably about an 80, 90% success rate right now. Things have been good with the shoulders. When the tendon is torn and it's not completely torn, now there's different levels of injury and part of what we do as physicians is when a patient comes to us with an MRI, we review it and we say this one would respond well to what we do, this one probably need to talk to a surgeon and there are points where we cannot help you and that is the fact. There's a time and a place for everything but with these partial tears, these half tears, a tear where it's not completely torn and ripped apart, there's some tissue between, we can inject these cells that we harvest from your bone into that defect and regrow the tissue in between. We do it quite often in the shoulder. It works very well. We also work with the ligaments. Injuries are very complex. When, a, when an injury takes place, generally speaking, one thing doesn't get injured. A series of things get injured. We also inject the ligaments, the capsule of the shoulder, in an effort to regrow and anatomically dissect what the injury is and then work piece by piece to rebuild it. So we spend a lot of time getting to the bottom of the injury. Ankle problems, again, ligament problems, problems where ligaments have been torn, stretched, overused. We can inject not only stem cells, also the platelets. We talked about the platelets. A large part of what we do, too, is figuring out which patient is better served by having a platelet injection, taking the blood, spinning it down, taking the growth factors, injecting them under ultrasound and x-ray guidance, and I'll show you that in a second, to the sites of injury and stimulating healing, stimulating that inflammation making the ankle swell on purpose to heal. And we spend a lot of time deciding who's better served by the platelets, which is cheaper, faster, less time consuming, or the cells, which is a little more expensive, takes more time. We always want to, if we can, we want to treat everyone with platelets if possible. There are levels of injury that are not able to be completely treated by platelets, then we move on to stem cells. And we spend a lot of time talking to patients, looking, and trying to offer the best treatment we can in the most minimally invasive and time and cost reductive way possible. So rotator cuff tears, again, we talked about rotator cuff tears. Um, just everything we do, we, we treat different types of patients. We treat some patients who are athletic. They are high functioning, professional people who are just wanting, he wants to go home at the end of the long day, he wants to go on a jog, he wants to keep himself active. We treat patients like that. We treat 50, 60 year old patients who have some degenerative conditions. They want to avoid a knee replacement. They want to avoid a hip replacement. They've heard of a story or they had a sister or a cousin who had a knee replacement, didn't go well, created a problem in the back, everything is connected. And they want to avoid them. We treat patients across the spectrum. I've been here this past week. I've, had, I've been blessed to have a good week. I've seen a lot of patients, a lot of nice people. I've seen patients from a 25-year-old rugby player to 70-year-old patients with osteoarthritis of the hip. Any, everything in between, lots of different conditions. So this, this, the, the treatments we offer, many different types of patients fall into the categories of patients we treat. 
Achilles injuries, tendon injuries, running injuries. These respond very well to PRP. Generally speaking, tendon injuries and ligament injuries that don't involve huge tears respond pretty well to PRP. It's more the arthritis conditions, the huge rotator cuff injuries, the huge ligament conditions that we harvest, spin down the marrow, isolate the adult mesenchymal stem cells that can promote skeletal repair and inject them to sites of injury. Arthritis of the thumb. This is the most common site of arthritis in the human body. This one responds very well to blood product, to blood product, to, to simple platelet injections. Most patients, by one or two injections, are at least 75% better. They're really doing well with these injections. And we use all the principles. We find every part of the injury, not only the joint, but the capsule, the ligaments that strengthen and reinforce the joint. We inject those. We rebuild the ligaments. We rebuild the cartilage. We work on the nerves that are sent into the hand. And we dissect the entire part, and we, re we, we regrow and try to regenerate every piece of the puzzle. Just, this is a, just a, a picture of some patients who have benefited from our procedure, allows them to continue an active lifestyle. So moving on to more advanced injuries, meniscal injuries, knee injuries. These are the injuries when we get to cartilage and heavy arthritis that we do apply more stem cells. The stem cells are capable of growing into new tissue and they control the entire healing cascade. Again, they're like conductors in an orchestra, forming in a construction site. They direct tissue repair. And when there's heavy injuries, big injuries that need more help, we use the cells in conjunction with the platelets. Now the platelets and the cells work together hand in hand when you use both at the same time. The platelets stimulate the cells to become more active. They stimulate the cells to, to divide and heal. Again, knees, arthritis tears, ACL tears, anterior cruciate ligament tears in athletes and football players. Under guidance, we can actually direct these cells into the ligament. And again, if the ligament is not completely torn and retracted, that there's some fibers between, we spend a lot of time looking at the MRIs, doing a physical exam and determining, yes, this could work for you. No, this could not. You need to talk to someone else, unfortunately. I'm um, just trying to be very forthcoming because it's very important. Ultimately, we want people to get better. That's why I became a physician. That's why I practice medicine. The most important thing is the best thing is done for the patient. And when I personally think, for instance, hip osteoarthritis, when I see a hip that the bone has begun to change shape, and it'll happen. In severe arthritis, your femur is very round. In severe arthritis, it actually becomes like a block. In my opinion, when it's that block in a round hole, go get a hip replacement. It's time for it, unfortunately. Levels of arthritis less than that, the femur remains round. Yes, we can work with those. We do well with those. But again, there's levels of injury. There's levels of degeneration. And sometimes, in very advanced cases, we do tell patients it, it is time to get a replacement. It is time to have surgery. So just moving on, patients who play golf, problems with the elbow, very common injury, overuse syndromes. People, I don't know, it's just been aching ever since I retired and I get to I, you know, I see that a lot of patients retire and they get more active and all of a sudden, it's like, what the heck? I worked 50 years to enjoy my retirement and now my body's breaking down. It's like, no, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, we can work on those injuries. I saw a lady in Colorado, she, she said just that to me. She spent her whole life working, she was retired, she just wanted to play tennis. She was like, I just want to retire and play tennis. Six months into her retirement, her elbow was hurting her so bad she couldn't play tennis. You know, she, she worked hard, she deserves to enjoy some Enjoy, enjoy some, of, you know, some, some of her later years in life. So we're working with her elbow to kind of bring back some healing. And then we're dissecting out the injury. Not only was her elbow hurting, her neck was having problems and the nerves that fed into the elbow were getting pinched up here. And I'll talk about that, dissecting the injury and kind of knowing what the problem is. Spine conditions, herniated discs. We do very well with herniated discs. Injecting, we don't use the cells... Um, for most of the discs. Sometimes we can inject into the disc and actually heal the herniated disc, but many times we inject around the disc the nerves, those platelets, those growth factors. We stimulate healing of the nerves in the discs. Again, herniated discs, working on spinal problems. These are doing very well, again, um, with what we do, both lumbar, cervical, thoracic problems. I'd say in Colorado, the majority of our patients, number one would be spine, number two would be knee, number three would be shoulder. So we do a lot of spine cases. And a lot of times there's overlap, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, and that's a very good point. And here we go, biomechanics. So everything is connected. From your head to your toe, you are one organism, and everything is connected some way, shape, or form. We spend a lot of time talking about biomechanics. So kind of just to give you an overview, a typical pattern we see 
somebody has arthritis of the outside of the knee. They hurt, and, and you start talking to them and you kind of get an idea of how this developed. They say, 10 years ago, I was visiting my sister in Connecticut and I was on a boat and I twisted my leg and I hurt my back and I had this shooting pain down my leg. And ever since then, everything just went off and we kind of dissect the history. And in her case, probably what happened, she herniated a disc in her low back, her L5 S1 nerve roots got irritated. The nerves got irritated that feed the muscles that control the hip. So her hip collapses inward. The glute muscles, the external rotators go offline. The hip can no longer externally rotate. The hip falls in. As the hip falls in, the knee falls in. Over time, the knee falling in wears down on the cartilage on the outside of the knee. You start looking at her foot, oh my gosh, fallen arches. The foot's collapsing and exacerbating the entire condition. So biomechanics. We can work on the knee, we can regrow the cartilage in the knee, but if we're not correcting the alignment that's causing the problem, where are we gonna to get to in the end? So we spend a lot of time finding the root cause of the injury and dissecting that. Maybe that patient needs some work on the nerves in conjunction with the work on the cartilage and some ligament work on the foot to restore normal alignment and allow the cells once they're placed to not only grow but to thrive and for that person to return to their highest level of activity. There's fascial planes, maybe you've heard of rolfing. Muscles are all individual, when you do a dissection, muscles are individual. The first thing I, when I was in, my, my first class in medical school was anatomy and dissection. And I remember when we were doing the dissection, I was shocked, but the muscles are just like in the pictures. They're individual. You can cut them away and it's like, wow, that's not just someone's idea. It's not just an artist's representation. The muscles are individual. Now the muscles are wrapped in fascia and the fascia are connected to one another. And those fascial connections can literally extend from your head to your toe. I've seen patients sometimes with a problem in their neck causing a problem in their knee. And once you release some tension in the suboccipital muscles up here and the cervical spine goes back into alignment, the knee goes back into alignment. The human body is very complex and it takes a long time to understand injury. And you have to be very thorough and very meticulous when you go through this. So keep working with biomechanics. Nerves, nerves control everything. Nerves control the flow of energy, of inflammation into the joints. When the nerves get injured, generally speaking, the joints begin to break down. So we see all of the time arthritis being caused by nerve problems. These are pathways of nerves. Nerves follow certain distributions and we can see by the distribution what area of the body is injured and we can kind of track that back up into the spine and then again, dissect the entire level of injury and we spend a lot of time doing that. Technology, how do we see what we're doing? So we use different types of technology. This is an x-ray machine we're doing a visualization of a spine technique here. This is an injection of some facet joints in the neck, working on some nerve injuries in the neck, which were causing some elbow and hand problems. We use MRIs. We review the images that the patients bring us. We correlate that to the physical exam. We, die, we get to the absolute bottom of the injury. This is an MRI of a rotator cuff tear before and after treatment. The white area is a very inflamed, injured area. This is after the stem cell treatment. It is healed. We do get post-MRIs about six, 12 months later, and we like to see when, injury, when injuries, injuries have happened and healing has occurred. This is an MRI of a herniated disc again. Here's the herniated disc, here's the healed area. So we actually can physically heal injuries, and it is not science fiction, it is actually happening. A lot of people are shocked when they see these things are happening, but it is happening. This is an injection of the ACL. This is how we get into the ACL. How do you get into the ACL? It's so deep in the knee. We use x-ray, we direct a needle, and then we shoot contrast. We outline the ACL. We know we're in because the contrast is flowing into the sheath. And then we inject cells into the sheath and we begin to regrow the tissue. So we rely on visualizing everything. Everything is done through either ultrasound and x-ray visualization. We don't just put it some we don't just put it in the joint, we make sure everything is going exactly where it needs to go, relying on those tentacles, relying on the intrinsic intelligence of the adult mesenchymal stem cell to attach to that tissue, get the signal and begin to grow into that type of tissue. This is ultrasound, a way of using sound waves to enter into the body, to shoot back signals to the probe and give us an inside view of the tissue. This is a ultrasound of a shoulder, a tear of a supraspinatus, both before and after less retraction, more tissue regrowing. Ultrasound and x-ray, those are technologies at this point that we're using. And I say at this point because we're working on beginning to bring in cameras. So that's happening now too. Technology evolves, biotechnology evolves. Technology is evolving very quickly. 
Everyone has seen that. So the advanced treatment options in the Cayman Islands. So in the Cayman Islands, we are able to expand these cells, multiply them. Multiply them 100 to 1,000 times more than we can in the states. The states, we cannot do that. It is not allowed by the Federal Drug Administration due to varying reasons, which I won't go into, safety not being one of them. 10 years of safety publications have proven these cells are not oncogenic. They do not cause cancer. They are safe. There's political and business interests involved in that. But nonetheless, uh, here in the Cayman, we were allowed to culture expand these stem cells. This is the most advanced orthopedic regenerative medicine practice in the Western Hemisphere, in my opinion, here in the Caymans. There's been about 1,000 patients and family members who have come to the Caymans uh, to receive treatment. And they come for the expanded stem cell treatment, the ability to expand these cells, multiply them, and inject them. And again, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times more cells can be generated, a much, much higher level of healing for these conditions. Patients are seeing much higher improvements here in the Caymans and in the States. These are the cultured stem cells. We take the cell, we put it on plastic, and that cell has the ability to multiply. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Just becomes multiply, multiply, multiply. Just grow, grow, grow. And when we multiply them, we have more. We can inject more to the site of injury. We can get more tissue repair. Cryopreservation, we can actually save these cells. Once we draw them, we can freeze them. Some patients come back two, three years after the draw. We then regrow them. And we can continue tissue repair well into the future. So one of the benefits of having the procedure here in the Cayman is we're allowed to store the cells. Some patients actually come, they're proactively thinking, oh, this technology exists, let me just do the extraction in case 10 years from now something happens. And we do do that as well. Um, so crowd preservation, we take the cells, we culture them, then we store them, then we can grow them again, and then we, in we re-inject them. Um, so at this point, I'm actually going to introduce a guest uh, who has come. Uh, she is a, a world-class athlete, a uh, track and field star who has competed in five Olympic Games, won uh, gold medals at various uh, events uh, throughout the world, still hosts a uh, Cayman Invitational here, still involved in, uh, in the social and uh, athletic scene here on the Cayman. Uh, Usman Bolt, Bolt uh, the Jamaican sprinter, actually came in 2013, attended her event. Um, so please, everyone, uh, help me welcome Ms. Sidoni Mothersill. Good morning. Um, I'm pretty excited about um, sharing my story. I had this procedure done in 2012. I was pretty, I guess, I would say a bit desperate. I competed in my, um, at the 2008 Olympics where I made it to the finals. And um, it would have been my fifth Olympic and I was pretty, I guess the weight of the country I felt was on my shoulder to compete. I had an injury where every time I got out of bed, I had to stretch for like 10 minutes. I literally couldn't come out of bed and step down because I would be in so much pain with my um, Achilles. And I also had a, bump on my shin that just, I couldn't wear heels, which I'm wearing this morning. I couldn't wear flat shoes. I had to put orthotics in my sneakers. It was, it just changed um, my day-to-day -day life. It didn't just affect me on the track, but it affected me off the track as well. And um, at the time when I was training in the States and I, I, I'd explore every option. I did everything under the sun legally um, that I was allowed to do to be able to compete in the 2012 London Olympics. And um, when I found out, my coach told me about this and I, I spoke with the then minister and he informed me that there was something that was at home that I maybe could have explored and which I did. And, it has significantly changed my life. Unfortunately, in 2012, I went to the Olympics, but I needed a bit more time. So for me, it wasn't that the procedure did not work. I needed more time to heal. My body needed more time to heal. I was getting a bit older, but in terms of after London, I can wear heels, I can wear sneakers, I can get out of bed without not feeling any pain at all. The bulge on my shin, which was quite unattractive, was, it was a large bump and I couldn't figure out what that was. And within a few injections, it was gone, completely gone. There was no pain um, in my Achilles. And when I did the procedures, it was very, I think I wasn't um, a believer at first. I just thought, well, I'd done everything and this was my last shot to be able to compete at the London Olympic Games. 
And um, over the time when I did the procedures, eventually, you know, I would be less pain. I didn't have to wear all these orthotics in my sneakers. I was able to finish complete workout more, you know, whereas before I would do a workout um, and then I have to cut it short because I do five runs and I had three that were great and I didn't want to push it to five and then it was going to hurt again. And as I went on to do this, um, so completed the procedure, I was able to do more. I was able to complete, um, to complete my workout. So it, 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 it didn't just help me on the track, but it really gave me um, a better life now that I'm retired. Um, I'm one of those that I'm very involved in sport. And um, I wanted to be when I'd finally retire from track and field that I could still um, play with my daughters. I have two daughters. I can play with my children. I can um, go for a jog if I wanted to. I could even do the parents' race if I choose. I wanted to be able to do things for me now that I'd finished given um, being a professional athlete. And this procedure um, made my life complete again. I had no pain. It's been many years since I've done the procedure, and I have no pain at all, um, which is excellent for me. I'm no longer running, but there's no pain. So for me, I became a believer, not just based on what I've read and what others told me. My experience showed that this worked. Um, it seems a bit crazy, it seemed quite futuristic, but it actually works. So that's my story this morning. So where is this going in the future? So the future is really, the possibilities are endless. I mean, every day we try to keep up the literature. Uh, Dr. Centeno, who uh, I work with, who's more or less been a mentor to, for me for the last two years as I've been working under him. It's been a very good group. I've had a very good experience. I feel very blessed to be with these, these physicians that I'm, I'm learning about this new and exciting field. Every day he's, he's sending us new papers. We're just, it's, a, it's an unbelievable field to be involved with because every day what we were doing yesterday is outdated. It's, it's advancing so rapidly. So the future, I don't know. I mean, I'm seeing things. I was at a conference, and there's these 3D printers now. And this is going to sound like science fiction, but it's really not. The ability to take these cells, grow them, spin them into a wire, put the wire into a 3D printer, 3D print three-dimensional cartilage defects, and then transplant those back into a patient. It sounds like something out of a science fiction movie. It's, it's probably going to happen within the next 20, 30 years. So um, things are moving very quickly. Um, thank you, everyone, for inviting me to talk. I've really have had a good experience here. Thank you.